Welcome to, welcome to the latest edition of the Reimagine Mobility podcast series. I'm here with Mitch Marks, Mitch from HBK. Welcome to the show. We're going to talk a lot about how we and how you, clearly, that's the man of the hour here, we want to talk to, sees mobility reimagined, as the name of the podcast states. So maybe to start out, Mitch, give us a little bit of a history, where you're coming from, education, where you work on, what you guys are doing. And then let's dive into how we reimagine mobility together. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I've kind of done my whole career in mobility-related fields, uh, mostly in the electric uh, electric automobile. Um, so I started out at uh, University of Wisconsin. Um, so I, I take a little offense to your, your Northwestern there, but that's fine. Yeah, by design. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I, I dreamed of going there, but uh, didn't pan out. Um, but uh, I started at University of Wisconsin in their um, electric motor program, which is which is really well renowned. Um, running a dynamometer lab, uh, looking at different control strategies for electric motors, um, different control strategies for grids to improve the efficiency, you know, improve the performance, cut down on on magnetic materials. Um, and, and running that lab there and working with all these projects really led into, uh, my career at HBK, um, where I've been doing business development for our electrification, um, portfolio, um, HBK, we make really high end measurement equipment. So that's, that's sensors, um, measurement devices, uh, some analysis software, and then, and then simulation tools, including some really cool, um, driving simulators. I think, I think you guys will meet with uh, Guido at some point, um, from the driving simulator group. But, um, what we find is that for, for research and development testing, you know, pushing mobility, people test for a variety of reasons, but I, I see three big ones to, um, to get things working. You know, in this mobility space, there's a lot of really new novel ideas, like, like back in the university days, trying to cut back materials, um, to include, increase the range or increase the efficiency of, of these electric vehicles, uh, troubleshooting, um, you know, supplier A and supplier B did not design together. Um, so you need to figure out why, why these things aren't talking together or to really do that detailed optimization. Um, so I'm a motor nerd, I, I guess to answer your question, I'm, I'm a total electric motor nerd. Um, but we're just really excited about where the field's going in either aerospace or, um, we're automotive. All right. Perfect. Well, let, let's jump right in. You talk about testing. You talked about what you did at the University of Wisconsin and um, in, in, in the testing and then some of the key areas of, of, or key reasons really why people are testing. As we reimagine mobility, again, as we look to the future, what are, what are the three things that people are not doing, companies, let's not say people, but companies, what are the things pe companies are not doing? That, in your opinion, as we look forward into the future, let's stay for a moment with with where your where your heart is, which with e motors here. Yeah. What are they not doing when it comes to testing? Yeah. So I, I think it it almost takes like a step back from testing, and and we have all these really great legacy companies, you know, axle manufacturers, transmissions, um, gearboxes. We're making a lot of commitments, a lot of moves into electrification, but I don't see them really making the investment in their people as much. Like there's some really good um, engineers who, you know, need to be reskilled and retrained into this electrification space. So before it even gets to the testing, you know, I think people will hire in new engineers with new expertises. We have a lot of really good technicians, a lot of really good legacy engineers who and I need that reskilling, but I need that vocabulary education. So if I had to pick, you know, three things, I think that's number one for me is, is that we have this kind of knowledge gap between like a really good workforce and, and where we want to go in this new mobility space. Um, so that's probably the first thing I would pick when we look at these big organizations. Um, and at, at HBK, you know, we, we kind of take this niche space where we try to bridge some of that gap, at least with the test side. For like the technicians, because these guys they get thrown in way over their heads, um, and and I mean bridging that knowledge gap is a, is a big thing. So that that would be my number one. Um, I think my number two would be 
you know, when we're looking at these new mobilities, we have a hundred years of knowledge on internal combustion engine. We have a hundred years of knowledge on aircrafts. Um, but when we put the, you know, electrified powertrain in, we have to worry about structures in a different way. We have to worry about sound and vibration in a different way. We have to worry about, um, weight distribution in a different way. It, it's a complete re-engineer of the vehicle. So from the test side, when people are troubleshooting problems, a lot of time they'll look in their little, you know, isolated world of, of sound and vibration or their isolated world of powertrain and coming together and starting to look at things as a system. How does that battery, how does that inverter affect the acoustic noise affect the durability pattern? <clears throat> you know, how does the, the weight distribution of the vehicle affect vehicle control? Um, you know, these are things that we've all been so isolated in our little, uh, silos for so long that, um, from the testing side, I would love to see some departments come together and, and really start putting effort into having test stands that are more inclusive to looking at everything at once. And I think that would actually lead to a lot of cleverness. Um, you know, when we test these electric motors, for example, you need to test at a variety of temperatures because they behave differently at cold or hot. You need to test at different battery voltages powertrain behaves differently at low battery versus high battery. What we really care about is drive cycle, not, not fixed efficiency points. So there is a world where if we were measuring vibration, uh, acoustics, looking at durability signatures, temperatures, and running just a ton of drive cycles, we could eke out so much more information. Um, so a lot of words to say, really thinking at a system level and, and trying to you know, be more efficient with how we test. We'll get more things at once. Um, and my third, I think there's a, there's a third point. Um, is starting to think about, you know, the, from testing standpoint, and th this bleeds into the, um, you're thinking at the system level is, is starting to plan for how do smart and connected things affect test. Um, you know, smart and connected, we can use a lot of cleverness to push efficiency. But from the testing standpoint, you know, testing more things, taking more data, understanding more points, you know, having that more system level thinking. Once these real brilliant people start coming up with these algorithms, it makes it so much easier to take this historic data we have and try to figure out and play games and match to the, the on-road data from the laboratory. So, um, yeah, reskilling looking at the system and, and thinking for how can we help the future? Because test is so reactive that being more proactive and thinking about what the future holds will, will help us because we're moving so quickly. Sure. Uh, I mean, again, I think in your last point, this is at least the way I understand you here is the, the ability to take this data that we have, which is rich, certainly can always be richer, but it's rich. Maybe use what everybody right now is jumping into and using AI to then come to the correlation to the real world even closer, which then allows us to update our simulation tools to then constantly start the cycle of reinventing or improving, maybe if that's a word, re-improving the simulation tool to get even closer to um, what we're testing in, in, in physics, right? So you're shaking your head. So with that point, we're dealing with a lot of OEMs and suppliers as well, obviously, and do testing just like you, but also heavily understand the on the technology development, engineering side, and productionization side, so to speak. And a lot of people, a lot of companies are looking more and more at the possibility to get rid of any physical type testing and go digital, digital twin simulated, whatever you want to call it, go digital, a hundred percent. You guys are in the business, you're in the business, you're doing it since school of testing. What's real here? We had a pat podcast several whatever episodes ago that talked about this as well. And it's a to me a very intriguing area because you you hear some that say, Will never happen. We may get up to fifty percent, but the other fifty percent we still gotta do physical testing. And then you really have the other camp that are like, That's possible. We're gonna go to hundred percent and we're gonna do this in the next two years. So interested in from your experience and where you guys are working in, what do you see, right? Again, 
we are reimagined mobility. So what do we see yeah. in the next five or 10 years, right? I love this question um, because honestly, I want the simulation guys to be right. I do. I hope our tools get that good. I don't want a job, but, but <laughs> the harsh, harsh reality of it um, is that, you know, per, per one of my first points, we only test in some really specific air, you know, modeling is so good. Simulations are so good, but when things aren't working, you need to test when, when you want to eke out that really last little bit of, of efficiency, you, you need to go to test because the model fidelity is only so good. Um, and, and when you're, tr or, uh, so I already covered troubleshooting, I covered, um, optimization, um, just getting things working, working in that really novel, like new space where we don't have modeling tools, you know, as we push innovation, um, it's impossible. <laughs> to model the cutting edge because we just haven't built up the math. We haven't built up the knowledge base. We haven't done the testing to make the models. Um, so is I see that. A, it, sorry to interrupt, but is it then, is it then a, a matter of time until we get to that level? Well, I, I think it, yeah, but it, people need to stop innovating for that to happen. Okay. Um, yeah. As long as, yeah, if, if you look at inverter switching, you know, we're pushing these silicon carbide gallium nitride switches up to these really high frequencies. And we see a lot of the phenomena we saw with microwave technology 30 years ago, where everybody said, oh, modeling is going to ruin it all. And then we push the frequencies up and things got weird. As things go faster, as they get smaller, material science, I mean, uh, I think one of the big issues that automotive companies are having right now is that the quality of steel or quality of magnets living in that unknown, living in that, you know, that area of modeling, we have to say my material property is this. Well, it's probably non-uniform and, and depending on where our supply is coming from or new suppliers, quality changes, that's an area for test. And then the other one, we look at the aerospace world. Nobody's going to let you put a plane in the world without validating. And, and frankly, I won't be getting in one, you know, if a car, go, if we do a car with simulation and the car dies on the road, whatever. I mean, there's a whole battery safety thing that I don't think we should simulate either. That's the safety aspect, but I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So I would love to see a day where we don't need to exist, uh, but I think it'll be a lot less fun of a world and a lot less safe, and, and I'd be afraid that people had stopped being creative. Um, so we're. I always swear that I, 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 I have nothing but mean words for the modeling people because they only test what they can't be modeled. Or not that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So then, so when when you then look at your customers again, you're a global organization. Which ones are are pushing some of the things we've already talked about, right? The reskilling of people, the the more system level testing, the more integration of data, usage of the data to really improve testing, not just to accumulate or make your data lake even even bigger or deeper who are pushing the boundaries, but also doing it the right way. Can you give us an idea here is, is do you see China doing this more? Do you see the U S being more deleted that is it Europe or is it, let's say outside of a, outside of China, rest of Asia, Japan, South Korea, some of the, I would say the hotbeds of, of automotive innovation. Can you give us an idea here? Who's maybe the lead as, as it relates to these, Let's call it, maybe I'll call it all this system, this complete holistic perspective of how to test. Who, who is leading this from, from what you are seeing? I, I wish I had a, a really like concrete answer for you. And I'm, I'm fortunate enough, I get to spend a lot of time in all of those markets, uh, you know, specifically right now, Asia. And, uh, you know, the Chinese companies, they're, they're innovating so quickly and they're doing so much. And, you know, for them, I, I, I see it really as a focus on, getting a vehicle people want, you know, between the outsourcing of powertrains, you know, so in China, I think it's more about just getting this vehicle people want. So I think they're kind of leading in the connected, in the connected space. You know, I don't know if they've made that, that gap to like starting to think, okay, we have autonomous. Now, how do we connect it to, you know, the, the Google leaf, you know, the more efficient paths and things like that and feathering brakes. I don't know if they've made that jump. I, I look at the U S and, um, 
you know, I see, I think people are really starting to think about how to make those connections. You know, I know Southwest Research Institute, public or private public partnership, they've got some really cool work going on in that kind of connected big data space. Um, in Europe, I know they're thinking about it, but they almost seem to get really tied up in the optimization. Um, which is great because once you've done that optimization homework, you're ready for that next piece. So I see it happening in little bits everywhere. Um, but I haven't seen somebody who's really, I think, you know, running ahead and, and paving that way because I, to me, at least it seems like there's a lot of people just trying to get product to market product. People want product that's, that's affordable enough, which is great. It's a different part of the development cycle. Um, but there are glimmers of hope in the national labs. There's glimmers of hope in, in some research institutes. And that's where I'm seeing more of this right now. Um, so I wish I had a better answer for you. You know, I see these little pockets, I see little pockets here and there, but, but not a big, um, tied together space where I do see it a little more is in the, um, the EV tall. And I think that's just out of necessity of looking at things as a collective, you know, kind of aerospace, um, needing to understand a whole system. I do see it a little more in the EV tunnel, starting to look at how we think more intelligently. And that problem's simpler because you're in the sky. And, <laughs> and do, you see it, do you see it there maybe because, I mean, automotive or on the ground, ground vehicles are different countries, different regions have different regulations and mandates, but clearly every region has even more stringent requirements for anything that's flying, right? Do you see that? Is that the reason why EV tolls are doing that? Is it the reason that EV tolls, in many cases, those startups come from people that are sort of coming from the maybe data or connected or non-traditional automotive or even aerospace field, and they they sort of bring that mindset? Or, or what do you see as, as, uh, yeah. as you make that comment? Because I would agree I, with you. I think some of those trends as well there. I, I see a couple of reasons for it. And one of them I think is really that they don't have the confides of like the existing road structure. Like they're starting from more of a blank slate. So the problem is less overwhelming, you know, thinking about being connected with, with a helipad that has, you know, right now, no flights a day, but in the near future, maybe 10 flights a day is a lot more simple than a stoplight that has, you know, 20,000 cars a day. Um, the unknown of the certification path also, I, you know, it seems like people just want to take as much data as possible, do as much modeling, do as much simulation, because the FAA and EASA haven't necessarily made things clear. Um, and yeah, it's just like this bigger, there's not the pressure of high volume production right now. There's, there's the pressure of getting something that works and is safe. And I think that, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that. I'm going to go with, you know, I think the simplicity compared to the existing automotive infrastructure. Oh, yeah, I think that's good. Let's, let's shift the yeah. discussion a little bit here. What do you see happening in, in the mobility space? Again, specifically around what, what you are doing, what, what the company is doing. What do you see happening over the next five years? What, what's the, what do you see happening and what's the most exciting part of that? What's happening? And you talked about data, you talked about the testing, you talked about the sensors and all the different things you guys can already do, but what do you see in the industry that you are in that's going to change over the next five years that you're super excited about? I, so the thing I'm most excited about is actually like, it's, it's exciting because it's like a really difficult problem and it's, it's production hell. You know, I think there's gonna be so many people going to production with these really, really cool new novel products and starting to figure out from a test side, like, you know, these, these really high end steels for motors, a little change in the tolerance on them can make a big difference in how they act. Same to be said with the magnets or as we remove magnetic material. So from, from my perspective with tests, people are going to have to do a lot of tests to understand how to tune the motor controller to handle these tolerances. How do we raise that durability? How do we raise that um, reliability given kind of the, the woes of production? Um, so I see a really cool space where we're trying to figure out how to make these things at mass and make them really high quality. 
and I think some really cool innovation comes out of that. Um, that and and um, the push towards you know these really really high efficiency motors. I mean, these things are getting so small, so power dense. Um, testing them becomes extremely difficult actually because there's nowhere to get measurements. They're yeah. so compact. The smaller, the more complex, right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, again, out of that falls the thermal, the vibration. These things are all so tightly interwound um, that, again, it comes back to the testing, understanding the motor control, doing cool things with making these small, compact packages really, really, really effective in the field. Yep. yep. So related question. <clears throat> you talk to people that do e-motors then you talk to people that do batteries and you talk to people and i'm just you but we all of us and you have conversations with people that work on the bms and the algorithms in the bms talk to people on inverters and i would say the last one at least in the electrification space if we stay there for a moment then you talk about chargers right and every single one more or less and has a passion in one of those four or five fields says over the next five years in my field is going to be the biggest innovation happening and the biggest advancement of technologies. Turning this around and giving this to you, this question to you, where do you see this? And specifically, again, from what you guys are doing, because again, like us, you provide test equipment to enable these companies to test out their sometimes crazy way out there ideas and sometimes very solid and maybe more conservative ideas. Where in this space with the head on of the test equipment supplier, do you see the most innovation happen over the next five years? Great, great, great question. Uh, you know, I think the motors, we've done a ton with motors over the last five years and inverters were damn near 99% efficiency. It doesn't get much better than that. So I'm gonna kind of chop those two off. I, unfortunately, I love motors, but I don't think that's where the innovation in the next five years is. Uh, we've done so much cool stuff. Um, you know, I look at the batteries and, and I almost, you know, chargers, they need to upgrade reliability, but they're kind of dependent on the batteries. So I would say fuel source more than anything, um, especially the General Motors new announcements for hybrid and everybody making investments in hydrogen and solid state batteries. That seems like the Wild West still. So that's really exciting. Um, it doesn't quite answer your question. I also think there's a lot of, per my previous answers, uh, innovation in the controls and the vehicle control um, and looking at how do we manage blowers and air conditioners and heated seats along with the powertrain. Um, so I think it's in the fuel source as well as um, in the control of the system. And, and yeah. Related to that second to last question, <clears throat> Everywhere we're talking about AI coming in, right? And years ago, when I was much more hands-on when it comes to software and controls, the statement we always made was, boy, if AI really makes it into a control module fitting for here, how the heck are we going to test this thing? Because it's AI. It changes. <laughs> I'm like testing. So question to you, is that one of the biggest challenges you guys look at as well? I mean, and not from the equipment necessarily, but from how – your customers yeah. will be challenged maybe less on the equipment, you know, saying, image, you know, I don't need more sensors. I got it all. But we have a solution to deal with. How the heck am I testing to make sure this is works? Because there is AI in here. The dang thing changes, right? Yeah. I, so I, I've listened to some really, really interesting talks from the FAA and EASA. Again, back to the aerospace. But, you know, having a machine learning based or an AI based controller for aerospace certification, it's like, you have input stimulus, you can follow exactly what happens and you get output control. And that's how we've certified forever. And now with some of these machine learnings, you have input, you, the, the path is not the same, but the output might be. So it comes down to, I think a really good design of experiment because for FAA certification, that's, that's planes falling out of the sky. That's lives. That's different than the automotive space. So I think we have to be really, really you know, prescriptive on the outcome. I'm running this test. Here's my desired outcome. Can I consistently do that? So I think we run into more of a statistics-based testing where, where we need to do more tests to get a good, you know, distribution on, I did this 10 times, 
but I did achieve the output I wanted 10 times. So I can call that safe, or I can call it reliable, or I can call it um, predictable. Because we run into the space of the path between point A and point B is anywhere. Wow. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool space. So from the test side, you know, I, I could babble down some rabbit holes of, you know, needing to have multiple points in between and needing to understand it. But I, I think the, the design of experiment and knowing what is our pass fail criteria or what we're looking for, you know, taking a step back and thinking <laughs> rather, rather than just doing what we're told, taking a step back and thinking, what is the result I want? Am I consistently hitting it? Yep. That's a good point. I guess that's, you know, at the end of it, that's good for your company and for my company because oh, yeah. testing and longer testing is needed. So it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. It, Test doesn't go anywhere. That's right. That's right. I would agree one way or the other. Last question for you. What's going to be the next car you're going to buy and why? Ooh, so I'm in Japan right now. Um, so I'm going to have at least one more year without a car. I have their wonderful Tokyo Metro system. Uh, but when I come back to the United States, um, I had a Mustang Mach-E before. I love that car. Um, I'm very compelled by the F-150 Lightning. Um, I really like the front of the Cadillac Lyric. I really dislike the back. So my answer right now is a Mustang Mach-E, unless I decide I need a truck or there's something really cool that comes out. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Mitch, thank you so much. Great insight. Very great perspective. Again, this is what we want on here when we, when we imagine mobility, different perspectives. Uh, appreciated the input. Thanks for getting up for us. Here it's evening. Here it's morning. Have a great day.